Are you an overwhelmed SaaS founder ready to make the leap from leading a team to leading an organization? Join us each week as we refill your think tank with actionable tips and strategies from great business minds you know and those you don't know yet. This is SaaS Fuel with your host, five-time entrepreneur, SaaS founder, and globetrotting adventurer, Jeff Maines. Welcome back to the SaaS Fuel podcast where we love bootstrappers. I'm your host, Jeff Maines. I help B2B SaaS founders like you scale ARR from seven figures, which is really good, to eight and nine figures, which is amazingly great, so that you create premium valuation impact and enjoy the freedom of running your business instead of your business running you. Well, we really do love bootstrap SaaS companies. Well, why? Well, one, because you're innovative, creative, and scrappy. Granted, you don't get your face on magazines or as many accolades in Crunchbase, but you got it where it counts, and that is the cap table. I know lots of founders who have exited and are kind of disappointed with the end result because the pie was divided up so much that the end really wasn't worth the sacrifice. You know, not too many people know this, but bootstrap SaaS companies are the majority, not by a little, but by a lot. And not just because they aren't investable, they're not because they're small, not because venture funds don't want them. They do it because they can. And that is a beautiful thing. Building a company that is cash flow positive, profitable, and self-sustaining, that's pretty awesome. So I'm at SaaS Open today, and I hope that you're here with, gosh, a thousand or more SaaS founders and leaders. I'm speaking this afternoon about three key ways to grow your SaaS in an uncertain economy. And tonight we're hosting a dinner called We Love Bootstrappers because we do and we can. It's going to be a lot of fun. So if you're here, come say hello. If you're not here, give me a shout out on social media. One of my favorite things to do is to spend time with other leaders, learn from them, share ideas, talk about what's working and solve problems. But the best time is when we just hang out, leave business behind, get out of our heads, and just be humans together. The funny thing is that when we do that and change our environment and stop hustling so hard, answers come. Ideas pop up. Solutions emerge. So whatever you're doing today, stop. Take a few minutes, 30 if you can, but we'll say at least five, and change your environment and just be human. Get out of your head and into life. And if you do that, let me know what you learn or experience in that process. Our sponsor today is Champion Leadership Group. Get free growth tools and map out a plan to scale your SaaS business from seven to eight to nine figures. Travel with fellow SaaS entrepreneurs on your growth journey, like we're doing here at SaaS Open, using a proven methodology that is mentor-guided, results-focused, and peer-supported. Celebrate wins and quickly rebound from setbacks. Learn to do the right thing at the right time to achieve profitable growth, impact, and freedom. Unleash rapid growth for your SaaS at championleadership.com. Our founder on Tuesday was Steve Benson, founder and CEO of Badger Maps, which is the number one app in the App Store for outside salespeople to upgrade existing CRMs with mapping, routing, and scheduling. Steve has a wealth of knowledge on sales and sales leadership. You know, I don't think I mentioned it, but he's the current president of the Sales Hall of Fame. That's just the level of his expertise. And he makes that available through Badger Sales University, which is also a very cool project. Our expert guest last week was Sarah Noel Block, inbound marketing expert, host of the Tiny Marketing Show. And she brought big ideas for content marketing, lead generation, and powerfully showing up for followers, prospects, and clients. You missed either one of those episodes. Go back and binge listen to those because it's fantastic, packed full of greatness. My guest this week is John Dougherty, a serial entrepreneur based in Denver, Colorado. He is the founder of two productized services. First one is Credo, and the second one, Editor Ninja. Both of them serve the digital industry. Credo helps companies find the right marketing or development agency to hire. Editor Ninja provides professional copy editing and proofreading services to marketing agencies and in-house content teams. Welcome someone who knows the search and agency marketing world like few others, John Dougherty. Well, hey, John, welcome to SaaS Fuel. 
Hey, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Love these topics that we're going to be talking about today. That's great. Well, let's start with your journey and how you came up with the ideas and started Credo and Editor Ninja. Yeah. So I've been a a digital marketer for a long time, been a professional digital marketer since about 2010, got my first agency job. I was living in Philadelphia at the time, got a job building links, doing SEO, but I have a developer and writing background. So I can kind of do most of the things that are needed in order to build a company. The only thing I don't really do is design, but I have a wife who is, my wife is is a UI UX designer. So she's taught me a lot and I've, I've come to appreciate it over the years for sure. But basically, I was, uh, yeah, I was working at that marketing agency in Philadelphia and then got a job with an agency in New York City uh, doing SEO, consulting on SEO. You know, the, the thing about SEO is it's, it's based off of technical, so development, content, and backlinks. So, you know, kind of selling people and, and, you know, marketing yourself and getting people to link back to your site. So I kind of had all the skills required there. And I also, my first job out of college was consulting. So, I was very good at working with clients, was working with um, you know, some, some household names, uh, it, doing SEO for them. So Intercontinental Hotels Group, TravelX, some other companies like that. Um, and then I went in-house for a couple of years with Zillow and ran marketing on a couple of their brands on hotpads.com and Trulia Rentals. But I initially started Credo in, it was like February, March, 2013. Going into the end of 2012, I was 28 years old, single, living in Brooklyn. And um, was working for that agency and had initially picked up some freelance work because I just wanted to make a bit more money, right? I was living in New York and I wasn't making bad income. I was at like 55, 60 a year, but you know, I just wanted to be able to go and do all the things in New York. Sure. So I uh, so I picked up some freelance clients and then basically got to the point where I didn't need the money and decided to stop consulting and had my clients being like, well, who should I work with? And so I built out a Google sheet of people um, I just started referring leads over to them. Um, stopped consulting into that year. Worked out perfectly because three weeks later, I met Courtney, who is my wife. We've been married. We will have been married for nine years in January. Nice. Um, so I had time to hang out with her. Um, and then I, I basically realized, you know, lead generation is big money. And I got in a lead that was a great fit for a friend that runs an agency in Provo, Utah. And messaged him, my friend Brandon. I was like, hey, man, would you be willing to pay 50 bucks for this intro? He's like, yeah, what's your PayPal? So three minutes later, I had 50 bucks in my PayPal account. He went and closed the work and made thousands of dollars. I bought, uh, went and bought a domain name and threw it up on some shared hosting and just kind of started <laughs> right. from there. So it was a side project. And um, then I actually got laid off uh, from Trulia near the end of September 2015 and um, decided I didn't really want a boss, um, you know, at least for a while. And, you know, now it's been over seven years, but I, I picked up some SEO <laughs> consulting and started working on Credo and uh, the rest is kind of history. So and then with Editor Ninja, which is uh, kind of the design pickle for content editing. So flat rate content editing services, Great. focusing on copy editing, proofreading. And we have some other uh, things coming up around like SEO and SEO editing and formatting and that sort of stuff. So that's coming out very soon. Actually, by the time this show launches, I, it should be out. It should be like officially messaged uh, sh- more strongly. But basically, I've been a writer for a long time and had, you know, was seeing friends that were, you know, finding writers is really hard and finding editors is just as hard. Um, sure. A lot of agencies are spending a lot of time, you know, either like someone in house is editing it or a writer is editing it when really they should be writing, right? Because like, because they get paid for net new stuff being written, not necessarily perfect stuff coming back. And so basically I launched it mid 2020 and then focused on stabilizing Credo and all of that. And then really started doubling down on Editor Ninja about a year ago. And we're approaching five figures in MRR now. And probably in the next week, we're recording this November 9th, in the next week, by the end of next week, we should have hit, we should hit a million words edited this year. So not too bad in our first year. Oh, that's fantastic. So how do you balance both of those companies? I mean, it seems like that would be like a full-time job for most people. How do you, how do you do that? How do you split time between them? Yeah. So two things. One is I, I very much manage my days. Um, according to my calendar, like I live and die by my calendar. And basically the way that I have structured it is the first half of the week is for Credo is dedicated to Credo. Second half of the week is dedicated to Editor Ninja. But each of those days, I also have an hour at the end of each day that's dedicated to the other company, to the other service. Okay. So Mondays will be internal Credo stuff, weekly standups, one-on-ones, like that sort of stuff. Tuesdays are external Credo stuff. So doing podcasts and calls and sales calls and that sort of stuff. If I partner calls, if I need to do them, 
And then I kind of shift and then four to 5 PM mountain time every day is, is dedicated to editor ninja for those days. And then Wednesday, Thursday, Wednesday's kind of internal uh, editor ninja stuff usually. And then Thursday is more external stuff and side projects. I co-host a podcast, that sort of thing. So I, I tightly control my days like that. So I dedicate time to each of them, but also um, we were talking about this before we got on, but really the the key has been, because a lot of people hear that and they're like, wow, you're, you're doing a lot of things, but really I have good teams on both. So I'm not actually doing that many things. Like I'm, I'm still with Editor Ninja, I'm doing more just because it's an earlier business. But with Credo, like my team, you know, largely runs the day to day of that business. So it's a lot more like kind of the owner mentality and, and making sure, you know, things are getting done that should be getting done. Is content getting published? Is traffic going up? Like all that sort of stuff. But, you know, I've, I've been very fortunate to be able to hire good teams on both. And so it actually becomes a lot easier to kind of, you know, run, do multiple things because I, I just have, you know, I have people, I have people working on both of them all the time. So it, d- it doesn't have to be me focused on them necessarily to make it keep going. And I think it's really important. Yeah, and, and I love that just that you have that, that owner mentality. So it's not, you know, that you're doing everything or, you know, I have to do this or it's not going to get done or done right. Uh, but the, that you actually are delegating those things. Has, was that a challenge for you in hiring and delegating those out? I mean, it, I think it's a challenge for most people, especially when, sure. you know, you start something, it's something that you know well and you care about a lot when you can do most of the things as well. Like if it's a, like with Credo, for example, Editor Ninja is a bit different. I'll get into that. But with Credo, for example, I started it because I had this overflow of leads, right? And so I started sending them to friends. Um, and then as we've as we've grown it and as we've scaled it, you know, I've I've kind of had to plug in different people because, like, you know, I realized at one point it's like, wow, I'm you know writing all this content, I'm doing, and I'm uh, you know writing code and building product features because we have our own like technology there for making introductions and scheduling calls, like setting appointments for agencies and that sort of thing. You know, I was doing a lot of that. I, I did bring on a, a business partner on the technical side, but I didn't have the time for leads, which is how that business makes money to schedule calls with me to have those conversations to then get introduced. Right. So it's like, wow, right. I had to, I, even though I'm good at sales, I had to, I had to, you know, scale it outside of myself and kind of teach someone those processes. With Editor Ninja, it's different because we're delivering it's content editing services. I am not an editor. I'm a writer, but I'm not an editor. So by virtue of just like that business, that business model, what we're providing, I've been forced to, I've I've needed to hire, you know, good people, good professional editors um, to kind of scale it out. And then I get to focus on, you know, the business side, the marketing, the sales, the product, that sort of stuff. And, uh, you know, there, there, there are definitely coming some pinch points already um, in that business, but sure you know, th- there's still a lot of it that like, just like the day to day, like delivery of the service, I don't have to do much in, which is great. Cause then I get to focus on the business, not be in the business necessarily, you know, to quote the, quote the e-myth. Yes. Yeah. And that's something I think a lot of entrepreneurs really chase and, and, or maybe not even understand how to get to that point of working on the business instead of in the business. It's so easy to get caught up with working in it and in, in the doing instead of uh, really strategically working on. Yeah. And you, you want to know when that unlocked for me? That unlocked for me when I read, like I, I, I read a lot. I, you know, love the e-myth um, and I'm very much of the, you know, the mindset of like, like I'll, I'll buy any book. I browse a lot of them, and, but there are a lot that I don't finish, but there are a few that I study and that I go really deep on. One of them was the e-myth. I've read that many, many times. One just on the entrepreneurial mindset is The Big Leap, which I'm actually reading again. It's probably my fourth or fifth time that I've, I've read through that and studied that. But the, uh, the, the one that really unlocked like being able to manage the business and manage the metrics and being comfortable hiring people is called uh, simple, simple Numbers, Straight Talk, Big Profits by this guy, Greg Crabtree, and actually mutual, our mutual friend, Dan Martell shared this book in SAS Academy one time and I read it and basically it taught me a ton about kind of managing the business and managing the metrics and like what is a fully funded, you know, business and how do you think about investing in growth, right? Kind of percentages to invest in marketing and people and, you know, all, all of these other things. And then that really like helped me sit. Basically, I, I did that and said, all right, we have three months of expenses in the bank. I can rest easy. I can afford to invest in things, right? Every quarter I review, you know, look at our financials and if there's extra, my business partner and I sweep it out, right? And take that as owner distributions, or we can choose to invest it back in. But basically there wasn't that like scarcity mentality of like, oh, is there going to be enough? It's like, yo, we have a hundred thousand dollars in the checking account. 
right? Like even if like a big customer let, you know, like fires us, right. Or stops working with us, we can replace them. And also like, I'm not going to have to, you know, do layoffs just because like I lost a customer. Right. So that really let me like rest easy and just like managing, you know, like the weekly numbers, the monthly numbers, the quarterly numbers, you know, all of that. That's what then let me kind of view people as like as an investment. And so I hire someone and look at like, okay, am I buying back my time? And is that time going into something else that is going to be revenue, you know, generating? And then with other other roles, sales roles, marketing roles, that sort of stuff, are they actually are they doing things that are in that are, you know, that are revenue generating, increasing traffic, which increases leads, which increases sales, that sort of stuff. So I, I think that's a, that was an important unlock for me that a lot of I see a lot of just younger entrepreneurs have not arrived at, um, and and doing that with Credo has then now I've been doing that from the very beginning with Editor Ninja, and it's making the business much easier to grow and manage. Now, so is it easier doing it than the second time? I mean, taking the lessons that you've learned in Credo and building that and and moving them over is Editor Ninja progressing faster because of that? Yeah, it's it's progressing faster. And it's also progressing more sanely. So I think one of the things about it, so yeah, yeah. And like, you know, when I was getting Credo off the ground, you know, seven years ago, really uh, working for myself, I was coming from a scarcity, like scared mentality of like, I need to make money, right? I was, I'd been married for 18 months. We were living in San Francisco. I just gotten laid off from this six figure tech job. I was like, I, I need to make money, right? So I was just doing whatever I, need, I I could do, you know, to make money. I had no idea about like managing a business and hiring contractors and like all this sort of stuff, right? I was used to working at a big company where it's like, hey, my laptop's not working. Take it to Ahmad, my IT guy, and he'll hand me a fresh one, you know, with all of my stuff like re-imaged onto it, right? Versus like, when you're working for yourself, I mean, I remember losing half a day of productivity because my dog, I have a uh, 100 pound black lab Great Dane, came up to say hi to me and he drooled on my keyboard, Oh, and wow. so I had to go get that fixed, right? Like I remember I took it to get it fixed and I was going to Mexico like the next day to lead a mastermind. So I went and bought like a, a Chromebook and took that to Mexico with me, <laughs> came back and my, like my laptop was fixed. It's just like, you know, stuff like that. It's just like, you know, when you're just getting started, it's just, it's just crazy. But over time I kind of like settled into it and I'm very happy being self-employed, starting and building companies. But yeah, all those those lessons that I've learned with uh with Credo have definitely come over to Editor Ninja just in terms of like like the business management side especially and you know I've hired I've hired 40 45 people in the last 7 years. And the bulk of those in the last 2. Probably over half of those in the last 2. So I've gotten very good at hiring people and finding good people to do to work on things you know that I'm not best at that I can do well enough but then just like need an expert to come in and do. Sure. So I would say about 20 to 25% of the like the processes and that sort of stuff carry over to Editor Ninja. And then also just like the mindset that I've I've gained around building Credo and, you know, just trusting that, you know, I know how to generate traffic, I know how to generate leads, I know how to generate sales, I know how to retain customers, right? All of that. I know how to set money aside for taxes, like those sorts of things. All of that, like that's all just settled. So now I can really focus on like the core of like, what is the offering? Who is the ideal customer? You know, how do I get the right team in place to really scale this thing? It is way easier the second time around. Plus, I don't have like the financial worries that I had for for a variety of reasons. I'm not like Editor Ninja doesn't have to pay me. Like we're we're it's here in about a month. I it will have been a year since I formed the LLC. I haven't taken a dollar out of that business. It's all been reinvested into growth. So you know that's it's, a big uh, difference too. Yeah, it's a huge difference. Huge. And I, I don't have to go pick up side consulting and that sort of stuff. It's like I I I can just focus on the business and you know and I'll start paying myself some in January. Just as kind of a like. You know, it just, it just psychologically, it feels good to pay yourself from the thing that you're putting yeah. a lot of time into, but I don't have to. And that's a very different like mindset than, you know, and I feel very fortunate to be in that place. And I know a lot of people aren't, um, but you know, it, and I wasn't there seven years ago, but you know, it's, it's amazing kind of, you look back and kind of see how you, where you've come. I think that's really interesting. Just hearing that the journey and, and you reflecting back on that if you read the, the media, I mean, people roll out of bed and, and create a unicorn overnight. <laughs> and that's, that's the yeah. story, but that's, that's yeah. not reality uh, for no. anybody, even, even the unicorns, it's, that's not reality. So, you know, just hearing, you know, that progression and the thought process behind it, I think is really helpful. Yeah. It's the classic seven years to overnight success sort of right. thing, right? Like you don't <laughs> see kind of what, what's going on, you know, people don't see my, my evenings and, you know, that sort of stuff working on it. I don't work weekends, but like, 
I'll plug in. I'm super productive from like the time my daughter goes to bed until about nine, nine 30. And then I'll watch a show with my wife and go to bed. And, but people don't, people don't see that stuff. Yeah. But yeah. And I think we run into trouble when we start kind of comparing ourselves to others as well. I don't want to give to a business what would be required to build a unicorn, right? With all the like selling, like taking money from VCs and managing, you know, managing them and then building, you know, hiring a ton of people and, you know, just all this stuff that all the travel and all the stuff that goes into that. Like that's yeah. not, that's not for me, you know, I'd rather build good, you know, profitable cash flow, you know, six and seven figure, you know, productized services and software companies. So yeah, I, th- I think it really comes down to like, what, what do you want to build? Not what are other people building and stop comparing yourself to other people. That's really good advice. And, and I like that the idea of taking a step back and just deciding what do I want to build and, and having a, a clear vision for that. Cause I've seen many people and it, it happens far more often than, than you think of people who build something, and then they become what I call successfully stuck. You know, mm. they, they built, you know, a monstrosity mm. that, that may be incredibly profitable and, and uh, you know, getting all kinds of accolades and they hate their life. Yeah. And it's like, well, well what good was that? Yeah. And so thinking yeah. about that, you know, what do I want to build and how does it, how does it serve our clients? How does it serve me uh, as, as a human? You know, yeah. is it, yeah. is it, you know, fulfilling as a person? Yeah. I think that's yeah. really important to think about. Well, and you don't have to have that stuff figured out from the start either. I right. didn't, I just knew I didn't want to go have a boss again, you know, <laughs> straight <laughs> yeah, up. That's like a pretty that, good that, starting that, goal. That was it, you know, but then the, yeah, I definitely built myself a job at some point. I was working a ton and wasn't super happy and it was stressful and you know, all of that. And you know, there were still those days, but you know, I, I remember having a conversation with a, with a friend, um, they're a, they're a trained uh, therapist. And I said something about like, man, I would love to like take a month off and, you know, go whatever, go to Europe for a month with my wife and, you know, just hang out on the beach, but I can't do it. And she looked at me and she's like, why not? (laughs) That's a great question. It was just mind bending. I was like, wait a minute. Like that was when I realized that like I can change my own reality around this stuff. Right. Like a lot of things in life that we can't change, but like, this is something completely within my control. And so like, I can, I can change how this works and how, and how much time it takes and, and all of that. And so like that very much changed my perspective on how I built the business. So, you know, things, these things change over time and you might get to a place where you're like, oh, I'm not super happy doing this, but guess what? That's a good thing. Cause now, you know, and now you can right. do something else and you can find what you are happy doing. So yeah. I, I think these are all, these are all good things to learn. Without a doubt. One of the things I wanted to touch on at the beginning, you said when you started Credo, one of the things, one of the reasons was because you had too many leads. I don't mm. know that there are very many entrepreneurs out there and certainly SaaS founders that would say, you know, I'm just getting crushed by leads. You know, help me handle all the leads because I don't know what to do. So what is something that, that you could say or advice you could give on, on lead generation and how do you create that, that awesome lead flow? Yeah, so there's a few things to it. And yeah, I mean, part of it with, with Credo too was, you know, I was, uh, I got well known in the SEO space. And so I had a lot of people wanting to work with me, like specifically on SEO. I mean, I basically didn't have the time. And, you know, as I, as I told you, I wanted to do other things. I wanted to go enjoy life in New York city as a, you know, single guy in his late twenties. But basically the way I think about the way I think about lead generation is, is kind of in a few in in a few stages. I actually have what I call the ladder of lead generation. I created it for service businesses, but it works for SaaS companies as well. So I think about it as uh, basically starting off with uh, the bottom rung of the ladder's referrals. So you're getting referrals from your friends, from trusted peers, that sort of thing. Maybe you've been working in a business like there's there. I remember there's a guy in uh, in SaaS Academy that uh, he has software for snow removal companies, and he had worked for a snow removal company and knew people that ran snow removal companies, and so he built out a system to help them manage their snow snow removal companies, right? The ser- these service businesses and knew all the things that were needed, and so he he got his initial clients there. Then you move on to your owned properties, so it's things like, and referrals could also be just so you know something like. Uh, G2, Captera, you know, things like that, sure. right? Because those are referrals. These are other sites that are ranking for these things and they're referring people to you, literally. Then it's your, your owned property. So it's your website, your social media, like that sort of stuff. Building your own audience there, right? So people start coming to you that you don't know necessarily, right? But they're coming to you because they're finding you in Google and, you know, they're finding you through content that you've produced or podcasts that you've done in the space or whatever, right? 
you know, so, so you're kind of building your own audience up there, then move on to paid and paid is Google ads and Facebook ads and that sort of stuff. You, you can, I mean, you can definitely sprinkle, you know, that kind of thing in there as well, especially early days of like, I launched this new offer. SEO and content is going to take forever and I'm not sure this is the right offer. So I am going to run, I'm going to take thousand dollars and put it into Google ads for the keywords that should, that this should convert on and make sure that people convert. And if they're not converting, then I need to work on my offer. It's not work on traffic. It's work on offer. So these things could be mixed a little bit, but that, but after you've kind of nailed your, you know, your, your inbound channels, then move on to paid as like top level acquisition. And then from there, go into platforms or kind of like outsource, like, like cold, you know, cold outreach, like SDO, like hiring BDRs to do cold outreach to try to like create more leads. Right. I think too many people try to do that early on and they waste a lot of time and money when they don't have an offer that people really want. So start with the referrals. Those are easiest to close. Then, uh, you know, work on your own properties, getting people to come in that, that you don't know they're signing up for your service or scheduling sales calls with you. You have no idea who they are but they found you through those channels. They move on to paid once you kind of have those offers and people are selling well, and they move on to the like, you know, the bigger platforms or, or cold outreach, BDO, you know, business development reps, that sort of stuff. That's how I think about, about lead generation. That's how I built, you know, all of my companies and honestly how I built my career um, to this point. Um, it works. It, it, it works very well if you kind of stage it that way. That's a really good way to do that. A lot of times people are just thinking, where do I go advertise? And, you know, right. what platform? And, and that's, that's so far down the road. And, and I really appreciate what you said about offer is you can go advertise till the cows come home, but unless you have an offer that, that converts and people just fall in love with, it's completely mm-hmm. wasted. Yeah, totally. Totally. That's, a, that's exactly right. And so this is why I think about like, let's test it out. Right. So don't think about it as like, oh my gosh, I need to carve off $5,000 a month for Google ads. No. 500 bucks, right? Start there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not, I don't, I don't love the like, and, and it kind of depends on your, your market and also more so the price of your, um, of your product, right? Of your service or, or whatever it is that you're selling. I hear a lot of, uh, you know, gurus and, and they're, they're just trying to convince people to get started, which there's a lot of wisdom in that, right? Like spend your first dollar on, you know, right. on marketing. But I talk to a lot of people that they've been told like, oh, just spend 10 bucks a day. 10 times 30 is $300 a month, right? But they're selling a fifteen thousand dollar, you know, a year program, right? And you should expect to spend, you know, like thirty percent of the revenue you expect to make from them in the first year on marketing, right? Basically, establish what is it that you're willing to pay in order to get a customer. So if you're, you know, selling a let's say a twelve thousand dollar, I'm gonna do some mental math here. So stick with me. Sure. Say you're selling a twelve thousand dollar a year program. So that's a thousand dollars a month, right? You're willing to pay two. Mu- their first two months up front to acquire them as a customer, right? So you're willing to pay $2,000 for them. 2,000 divided by 300 is seven, right? So are you willing to seven months, right? Pretty close, pretty darn close. It's like 6.8 or something like that. So pretty darn close. So are you willing to, you know, to, to take like at $10 a day, it's going to take you seven months to get one sale, right? I don't know anyone. No one should be that patient, right? With a channel to, to get that. So, Take that money and put it up front. Don't spend like 10 bucks a day necessarily. Spend 500 bucks in two weeks, you know, to get, to try to, you know, try to get people in, try to get a few phone calls, you know, coming in even better, take a thousand dollars and spend it in two weeks. So you're not trying to figure out, okay, how do I spend, you know, a thousand dollars a month? It's like, no, take a thousand dollars and test, right? And you're going to find out pretty quickly if you're getting clicks, if you're getting demos set up or you're getting signups, free trials, whatever that is, right? And then you can kind of worry about the funnel down from there. But the, the challenge, the problem I see or the mistake I see so many people making is they're not spending enough up front and they're not testing out, you know, their offers and their messaging and that sort of thing. They're taking too long to learn. So even if you don't have much money, right, can you, can you carve off 500 bucks to try some, you know, try some new messaging and spend that in a week, right? Cause that's a 2000 that's a $2,000 a month like spend, right? If you spend that every single right. week, spend it in a week. You're going to learn a lot. Way, you're going to learn the lessons way faster. You can learn in a week what, you, what it would take you basically two months, almost two months to learn if you're just spending 10 bucks a day, right? I would way, way rather learn that in a week and you know, quote unquote risk wasting 500 bucks than like risk the same amount of money and it take eight times as long for me to, to learn those same lessons. It's all about speed. Sure. Yeah. Fail fast. 
Right. Right. So, yeah, that's, I mean, that's when you, you learn yeah. because you can yeah. adjust and probably even within right. that first week in the first two or three days, you're going to have some pretty good information about, uh, you know, whether to continue, whether to ramp it up, you know, is yeah. it working already? Do we need to make some tweaks? So totally. you, you can learn totally. things very, very quickly. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, take, take a little bit of risk, but do it in a smart way, right? Don't say, don't go risk $15,000, right? 500 bucks. So, you know, something like that. If you haven't done this before, you know, that, that right there is going to teach you a lot, right? Honestly, that's a pretty cheap education right there anyways. So yeah, like in order to, you know, in order to fail fast, you have to be willing to take some bigger risks and, you know, you have to, I mean, you have to be willing to fail, right? Which too many people aren't. And, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty risk averse entrepreneur. So it's taken me a while to kind of build that like failure muscle, but I'd rather, you know, you have to fail before you can find success. 100%. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to ask John about uh, the marketing function, whether it should be internal or agencies and uh, how to hire an agency right after this. Today's episode is sponsored by Small Fish Big Pond, building a world-class business that swims circles around competitors. Why do some companies achieve explosive growth while others sink into the depths? What do exceptional SaaS companies do that mediocre companies don't? What can SaaS leaders learn from fish? Small Fish Big Pond delivers powerful business lessons guaranteed to change the way you view your business and includes hands-on exercises and growth tools to get lightning fast results. Get your copy today at smallfishbigpond.com and use the code SASFUEL to unlock special bonus content. Welcome back to SASFUEL. My guest today, John Dougherty, founder of Credo and Editor Ninja. And John, tell me about how we should think about working with agencies or should marketing functions be internal or how do we find and hire a great agency? Yeah. Kind of two questions there. One is who should be responsible for your marketing, right? Right. And then so in-house or, you know, an agency or a bunch of freelancers. That's the other one I hear. And then if you're going to hire an agency, how do you find them and how do you vet them? So the first one is, first of all, who you hire or the the role that you hire kind of depends on on the skill sets you already have internally. So I'm a marketer by trade, right? I'm an acquisition marketer by trade. So you know, I can do I can do the SEO. I can create I can create the content. I'm, you know, I'm decent at Google Ads. You know, I'm not a designer, but I can use Design Pickle to get good ad creative put together and run Facebook ads, right? Like I can do enough of that. And so for me, you know, but basically you need to have someone internally who understands marketing, right? Who can kind of lead, lead the charge there, right? But both understands it and values it. So, you know, don't go hire, don't go hire an agency, you know, if you don't know marketing at all, because, or don't go try to hire an agency because you're probably going to get taken advantage of because you don't know what to listen for. You don't know red flags to listen for. You don't know the right questions to ask. So if you're, you know, if you're a product focus or an engineering focus founder, partner up with someone, find someone like a fractional CMO sort of person, fractional like marketing leader sort of person that can come in, kind of establish these are the channels that seem to be working in the space, or these are channels that we've seen work before. And then they can go and hire and manage an agency, right? Or maybe they can do one of the channels themselves and then they hire, you know, an agency for, you know, to kind of execute on the other channels there, but they know the questions to ask and they're measuring the metrics, right? Because I see a lot of uh, a lot of companies will hire an agency and then they'll fire them three months later because they're like, well, we don't know what we're getting. It's like, well, you're not measuring anything, right? <laughs> like, right, how are you going to know? Right. What you, like, like they're doing work, but they say we don't know the results that we're getting. Well, because you're not measuring the results, right? The agency should be reporting results to you, but the agency isn't the one responsible for your like trials to, to paying customers conversion rate, right? Like, you right. should know that, right? And so, like, if you're getting a thousand trials, right, you should know as the founder or director of marketing or head of marketing or co-founder or whatever it is. How many, like, how many, uh, you know, paying customers that should turn into, right? And what's the lifetime value there and that sort of thing? Like, you need to be doing that work. Don't just sit and rely on an agency to do that, right? Someone internally needs to be accountable for the results, right? They're not responsible for getting it done. They're not executing on the campaigns themselves, but they are accountable for the results because at the end of the day, it's your business, not the agency's, right? If you fire them as a client, right. they're going to go get another client. You know, their business is clients, not not your business necessarily, though they are trying to grow your business. But I think you get what I'm saying. Yes. I think the kind of the, the best way to start off is, you know, hiring either being a, a marketing focused founder or co-founder or whatever yourself or hiring someone, you know, a part-time person to start off with probably who's kind of a marketing coordinator and can be responsible for the metrics and all that sort of stuff and making things, you know, m- making things move in the right direction. 
eventually, yeah, you'll probably get to full time, you know, full time people internally. But I am personally a big fan of what we call marking the hub and spoke model of hiring, where you have like a person or a couple of people internally that are they're they're a little bit more senior, but they're kind of marketing generalists, right? And they also have a good like operational and project management mind. And so they're like kind of responsible for different channels, but they're working with outside vendors, outside agencies or, you know, freelancers, whatever, to to actually execute on the campaigns. That's how I've done it at Credo. You know, over the years, we have a PPC agency, we have a Facebook ads uh, agency, we have a, a content marketer who's, you know, freelance kind of 10, 15 hours a week, something like that, you know, that I was, I was managing that, that I manage there. So that's worked well for us simply because I know marketing, right? But there are other people like other founders that are, don't know marketing that are more product and engineering focused that you, you, you should hire someone internally. And that'll probably be your first full-time hire on marketing is just the person that's responsible for the marketing function but they're not expected to do all the things. They also need a budget to go and hire people to execute on campaigns in the individual channels. So that's how I think about that. That's how I think about hiring for marketing, especially like early stage and tell about, and you'll probably bring on that first full-time marketing hire around a million ARR is about what I see. Somewhere between 750 and 1.5, but a million is about where, where, we, where I've seen it like work the best. Before that, it's a bit too early. Before 750, it's definitely too early. And at about a million and a half ARR, so you're at like 120 MRR, that's probably too late. You're, you're probably leaving, leaving growth and opportunity on the table. So somewhere around, so start looking to hire around 800, 850, and then hopefully you're growing and then you'll have them in. They'll be up to speed once you hit around a million um, ARR. I think that's, that's a great range. Uh, before that, a lot of times product market fit is still maybe a little bit shaky. The messaging is not quite as, as mature it is. And if you start yep. going to market with that, then it, it falls flat and you go, well, it didn't, you know, advertising doesn't work. You know, this marketing channel doesn't work. And that's not really right. the case. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. And when I hear someone say like, oh, that doesn't work for us, which like, don't get me wrong. I have said this before as well. I literally said it no, yesterday talking with someone at, <laughs> you know, at, at Credo where we, we were talking about like cold outreach, right? And like, like outreach and, but I mean, but also like different channels, any channel can work. How efficient it is for your business is is varies based off of the specific business itself. And you know, if you're selling high ticket stuff, you're selling enterprise deals, you can pay six hundred, eight hundred thousand, you know, per like qualified, you know, qualified call, right? Because you need one of those three to close. And you, you know, you've if the average deal is a hundred K, right? Like, you know, yeah, I'll pay three thousand dollars to get a hundred K deal. Absolutely. I'll pay twenty thousand sure. dollars to get a hundred K deal, right? But a lot of people aren't doing that. And so if you need to get leads for 200 bucks a pop, cold outreach isn't going to work for you, right? But like SEO probably, SEO will, content will, Google ads might kind of depending on the cost per click and your conversion rates and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, don't just say like, oh, that, that channel doesn't work like for, you know, for our business. It might not, but like most channels will work for most businesses. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Like, but sometimes you can also get into a specific channel that could work. You're getting into it too early. Right, because your messaging isn't mature, because your product market fit or your market product fit, which is the way I think about it, yeah. um, you know, build a build a product for an existing market. Don't build a product and then try to find a market. But uh, so I, I actually flip those. But I think I think yeah, before seven fifty, you know, million, it's 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 a little bit too early to really pour like significant money, and I'm talking tens of thousands a month into, into marketing. And I try to, I try to, I I usually tell people ballpark, if you're in like maintenance mode with marketing, like maintenance mode in your business, then spend about 10% of your gross monthly revenue on marketing. If you're in growth mode, you're at like 20, 25, 30%, right? You know, until then I try to keep it until you like have pretty solid, like product market fit or market product fit. I usually say target around to spend between 15 and 20% on marketing. And then once you're really ready to put the pedal to the metal, then you can, you know, dramatically increase that, you know, if if you need to cut back on it, you know, you're kind of going into more like maintenance mode sort of thing, which I don't really believe in maintenance mode, but you know, then you're spending five, 10% of your monthly revenue on marketing. So that's kind of the way that I like, I I think about how much you should spend on marketing as well. Now that makes a lot of sense. And I think the other thing you wanted to ask about you, that you asked about that I hadn't answered yet is how do you hire a good agency? So yes. There's a few questions yeah. you ask an agency. So first of all, 
you know, do your Googling, right? Search, you know, if you're a SaaS company, search best SaaS SEO agencies, that sort of thing. Do some of your own research there, go to different websites, kind of, and that just kind of helps you understand like what's out there. How are different people talking about these things, right? Like what, what should you expect? What are the terms you should expect to hear? Look at their blog, see if they're teaching, right? See if they're like, you know, kind of helping you understand, you know, what, what it, what it involves, all that kind of thing. Like those are going to be the best people to work with because they're actually able to explain and they're willing to explain what it is that they do. Right. So they're going to teach you as they go, um, which is, which is great. But then once you hop onto, you know, onto a call with them, you know, you're looking for a few different things. One is, you know, do they have case studies that they can talk about? Even if they can't show the name of the company that they've worked with, they should be able to talk about, well, we worked with this company in this space and we, they had this problem and they did, we did these things and we saw these results, right? Obviously results are not guaranteed and, you know, past, uh, what is it? Past results are not a guarantee of future, future results or something like that. Right. But, uh, you know, they should be able to talk about work that they've done. And for similar types of companies, they've done the kind of work that you're looking to have done. So SEO or Google ads or whatever, have they done it for the kind of company that you are SaaS, And have they done it for a company that is it, that, that is, uh, basically in the same stage as you are, right? Like if I was going to hire an agency for editor ninja, for example, to do Google ads for us. I don't care about the person that scaled Salesforce's, you know, Google ad that doubled Salesforce's Google ads spend because Salesforce is spending tens of millions a year on Google ads, right? Right. Like I might be spending 2000 a month on Google ads, very, very different like strategies and, and, uh, you know, tactics that, that are going to get you there. So look for, look for people that have experience in or specialize in working with your type of company in the in the kind of stage that you are to achieve the kind of results that you're looking to achieve right and they can also tell you you know if you're saying hey we want to double in the next 3 months they should be able to help you understand how much you're going to have to spend is that even reasonable to expect what all is going to need to be in place like all of that right they should help you right. really like think through that you know, they should ask you about, uh, you know, results of, uh, you know, how you're measuring results and what, what have your past results been? And, you know, what are your conversion rates and all that sort of stuff? They should ask you these deeper questions that help you know that they really understand your business and they should ask you questions. This is a key one that you don't know the answer to, which is great because it means that they have seen it before and they can really help guide you, you know, and help you get the right things in place. Um, so that's really what I, you know, what I look for or what, what I, what I kind of teach people to look for. It's not easy, but you know, I, I think there are some ways you can kind of de-risk the hiring. I see companies not as much anymore just because, you know, budgets have gotten tighter, but pre pre pandemic, especially. And then even last summer when everyone was like, woohoo, everything's opening back up and we're spending money. Right. And anyone, anyone that's still in business is like doing great and has big marketing budgets and all that people hire too fast, right? It's like, Oh, you sound good. Yeah, sure. I'll take a flyer. I can spend five grand or 10 grand or whatever. And if I waste that, no problem. But you know, if, if, if you really need this to work, you know, make, make sure you kind of do your research on them. And that means initial call, uh, kind of a discovery call, get to know them. What's the, what are their, you know, do you like them is a big one, honestly. Um, yeah. but also like, you know, all the things I already talked about, about, you know, working with companies like you in the stage you are and, and all of that. And then uh, ask to do a, a longer call. Do like an hour long call, like a strategy call, just really going deep. And they should be like, you know, if they need some like access to your Google analytics or search console or Google ads or whatever, like give them read only access, right? You know, if you need them to sign an NDA, most of them are, you know, happy to do that when you're sharing your like proprietary data with them, but go deep with them and they should be asking you even deeper questions and making suggestions, right? Like, oh, I would, you know, what have you thought about doing this? It's still a sales call. But it should be going, you know, they should be going deeper and really showing you how it will be working with them. And then before you sign a proposal, make sure you understand what the scope of the work is, right? How many hours or who's going to be on your account? How much spend should you expect? Like all of those sorts of things. Because a lot of agencies will go ahead and send you a proposal and it's like, it's, it's you know, everything in plus the kitchen sink or maybe an extra kitchen sink. And you're like, wow, that's way outside of my budget, right? But like they start there because it's like, maybe that's the ideal thing. but you know, you should work with them ahead of time to really, for them to really understand what it is that you need. And then they should be, you know, not trying to even upsell you in that initial proposal, but just proposing you, Hey, this is what it, what it looks like you need. And so this is, you know, what it's going to cost to get there. Right. I mean, if you understand the scope, then you can trim out specific things as well. If you need to get it, you know, if your budget is five and they propose you seven, well, where can we cut back here? Can we do a couple of fewer hours with this or a couple of fewer hours with that? Or, 
you know, what can we save? Can we do the design in house? Uh, you know, in, right. instead of you taking care of that floor, it's like there are many ways to get that down. But uh, if you don't understand what all the things are they're going to be doing, if they don't understand that either, then it's basically a yes or no, or you're asking them to take a take a pay cut to do it for cheaper or something like that, and that's just not a good way to start a relationship. No, without a doubt. So, what is one or two lessons that uh, you know you'd love to go back and tell your younger self, maybe back when you first started out? credo that you've learned along the way. Yeah. Yeah. Number one is surround yourself with great people. I have over the last number of years really moved because I was definitely like the SEO guy for a long time. And I've very much moved my online, my community to being other entrepreneurs. Right. And so like, get it, like make sure to get yourself into rooms. You may have to pay to get in there, but get into rooms with people much smarter than you. You know, like I've been in, I've been in rooms learning, you know, learning the same things, learning from the same people as people that are worth, you know, nine figures now that have sold like nine figure businesses. You know, I mean, yeah. I was in the room. I remember my first SAS Academy, I was in the room with like Alex Hormozzi and Ryan Dice and Syed Balki and Russ Perry from Design Pickle and like all these guys. I was just like, what am I doing here? You know, like it was crazy, but like it was amazing. <laughs> you know, like I learned so much from those guys. So, so that's a big one. Prioritize being around other good people. Number two would be just like take the long view. Take the long view of like, you know, and people say it's not, it's kind of like pithy now, but like people overestimate what they can do in a year and they underestimate what they can do in a decade. Yep. So, you know, I'm seven years on now and I look back, I'm like, holy crap, I've learned so much about running a business and being an entrepreneur and managing my own psychology and, you know, and all of that. So, um, you know, take, take the long view of it. A third one would be all of your customers are not going to fire you tomorrow. It's a, it's a mm, common thing. People get scared. I was scared about that. Let me put it that way. I was scared of this, that I'd wake up at, for the first 18 months of work for myself. I'd wake up every day and be like, this is it. This is the day everyone fires me. This is when the day everyone figures that like the gig is up, right? And I'm gonna have to go back and get a job. It's not gonna happen. So just just trust in that, right? And keep keep building towards the the longer term, right? Don't don't trade your long term well being for short term, you know, gain because anything you get short term probably isn't gonna last, right? Those quick sales, right. they're they're always the quickest to churn, that sort of thing. So you know, build look look towards the medium and the and the long term. And then the fourth one is make sure to take care of yourself, right? Make sure to have hobbies, eat well, you know, drink a lot of water, <laughs> you know, these, these sorts of things like take care of your body, go to the gym, right? Move your body every day. I take a 30 minute walk. I go to the, every day I go to the gym multiple times, you know, a week. Like I take, I take good care of my body because like if my body is healthy, then my brain is healthy. And if my brain is healthy, I'm going to be able to do better work and I'm going to be more patient. I'm not going to be as quick to like get angry or get frustrated or something like that. Those are really the things that I, I would have, uh, I wish I knew back then to prioritize as I, you know, went about, as I go about building companies. I think that's really good advice, especially getting out and doing things that are, are not business related, you know, taking care of yourself. I mean, to me, that's where some of the best ideas come from. And, and yeah. we think that we're, we have to stay plugged in and, and just grinding all the time. But it's yeah. those times where we we let go and go out, and it's you know on those walks, it's on the the workouts, yeah. it's it's when we're doing things that that you know our mind is free. Yep, I think yep. that's where great yep. ideas come from. I get mine when I'm hiking. Yeah, I spend a yeah. lot of time in the mountains. I live in Denver. I spend a lot of time in the mountains. Like when I'm hiking, I used to carry a little notebook. Now I just have my phone and my notes app. But I used to carry a little notebook because I'd be walking along. Uh, I remember one time in, in uh, California when we still lived there, we were h- hiking along. I was thinking about this thing at Credo. And we're like six miles out from the car, like on top of this mountaintop. And all of a sudden <laughs> I'm like, that's it. And like, I, I solved yeah. it. Like my brain just solved it right there. And I wrote it down and, you know, I, I implemented it and it worked. But like, take, take space. Like there's no reason to keep sitting in front of your computer if you can't kind of solve this, uh, you know, stuff like, you know, go, go for a walk, call a friend, right? Like that kind of thing, kind of depending on how you process stuff, go read if that's, you know, if that yeah. inspires you and that gets you thinking like there are a lot of things you can do. Like sitting in front of your computer is not, is probably, is not usually the right way to work through the big problems that you're having. You need to get space. Love that. Well, where can people find out more about you and about Credo and Editor Ninja online? Yeah. So me personally, I spend a lot of time on Twitter. I'm at Doherty JF, D-O-H-E-R-T-Y J-F. So that, that's the best place to kind of, you know, communicate with me directly. And then Credo is getcredo.com, G-E-T-C-R-E-D-O.com. And Editor Ninja is just editorninja.com. So 
Um, you know, if you're looking to hire an agency, my team at Creato would love to speak with you. You know, if you're producing content and you know really want to make that content sing and make it achieve your your business results, that's why you're investing in it for marketing, anyways. We, I'd love to talk with you at Editor Ninja, kind of show you show you what we can do over there. So thanks that's for having great. me on the show. I appreciate it. Absolutely. We'll make sure and link all of those in the show notes. And it's been a great conversation. Thanks, John. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks again, John, for coming on the show and sharing your journey, insights, and great perspective. You can learn more about John at getcredo.com. As always, all links, highlights, resources, and full show notes are available at sasfuel.com. Please subscribe or follow us there as well. And everyone who subscribes this week gets an invite to our We Love Bootstrappers dinner tonight at SAS Open. And if you're not here, subscribe anyway, and I'll owe you one next time we're in the same city. Well, join us next time for a great discussion with Osa Sarenko. He is a three-time founder and former co-founder of Fifth Star Funds VC. He's applying lessons from the tech and finance world to create a demonstrable impact on restaurant operations and sustainability. Very good stuff. And Thursday on our expert series, we have Travis Chapel. He is founder and CEO of Guestio, the highest quality podcast guest marketplace in the industry. Travis is a door-to-door salesman turned SaaS founder, investor, speaker, and podcaster. It's an amazing story. He's also the co-host of the top-ranked podcast, Build Your Network, and Figuring It Out. You won't want to miss either one of these. So say hello at SaaS Open, and as always, enjoy the journey. Thanks for listening to SaaS Fuel. Full show notes for each episode, which includes a summary, key takeaways, quotes, and any resources mentioned, are available at sasfuel.com. Be sure to follow and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you're enjoying the content and getting value from these episodes, please leave us a rating and review at ratethispodcast.com slash sasfuel. We'll be sure to read these out on future episodes. 